Tonight. Hey, good evening, everybody. We are live and we're bang on time. Um, and um, we're a bit, well, we're a virtual and an in person event tonight. So, so welcome to this uh, um, hybrid lecture. My name is James Collinson. Um, I'm the current chair um, of the Railway Division of the Institute of Mechanical Engineers. And it is my privilege um, to be able to introduce tonight's lecture. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so just to kind of uh, let you, uh, well, A, there's people in the virtual room over there by the camera. Um, and for those in the virtual room, I've also got about 20 people um, in the physical room here at um, Birdcage Walk. So, so thank you very much, everybody, for, for attending those both online and also in person. Um, it helps to make these events really great by having, having as many people as we can and, and obviously a combination of both. So, so welcome to the George Ramshaw Curry Memorial Lecture um, entitled The New Alstom the Bombardier Acquisition One Year On, which will be presented tonight by Mike Hume. Um, I'll take a few moments to, to introduce um, some setting points about Mike, but, um, and then hand over to him, because I'm sure it'd be more interesting what he's got to say than what I'm saying. Um, so, so firstly, I, I noted that Mike is a chartered engineer and a fellow member of the Amici. So he's a member of our team. Very good, good start. Um, and he joined Alstom 21 years ago. Um, so so has, has been in various uh, senior positions, um, but today talks to us as, as the engineering director of, of Alstom UK and Ireland, um, where he heads up the, the UK capability in vehicle design and systems engineering. So including a team of over 400 engineers who are based at the Derby Litchurch Lane. Um, Mike assumed the role soon after Alstom's acquisition of Bombardier Transportation. So it is a very good position to tell us how it went um, and share with us his experiences of what's happened and also over the last one year on where it is. So Mike, I shall hand over to you and make sure I don't take notes. Thank you, George. Thank you. So good evening, good, good evening all. Good evening everyone in the room and also online. Um, just by way of a quick introduction to myself, as long as the uh, promise of technology would work. So moving on. <laughs> right, super. Um, so, so yeah, just a few words of introduction uh, by myself. Uh, I actually uh, left school in 1985. And there uh, was a sponsored student with uh, British Nuclear Fuels at Southfield. I uh, actually worked at Southfield for 16 years and uh, ended up looking after engineering uh, at uh, Calderhall Power Station, uh, which was the first power station or first commercial power station that was commissioned in 1956. Um, given lack of investments in nuclear, I actually decided to leave nuclear in 2001 and uh, joined uh, the, 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 the um, Alston in Preston, uh, where Alston at that time was actually manufacturing uh, traction and auxiliary equipment uh, supply. I uh, spent a couple of years in Preston and then actually went through various service roles uh, in the UK uh, to become head of service uh, for a period of four or five years, around about 2010. And, and obviously through that time, saw so all the, uh, the challenges of the introduction of Pendolino uh, and also the, uh, the ongoing uh, challenges on Juniper and Caradia uh, projects. Um, went off to, to, to work a little bit with stagecoach in terms of a couple of bids, uh, and then returned over the last uh, sort of couple of years very much into the services full uh, within, within Ulster. Um, this time, two and a half years ago, uh, I could never have envisaged being here today uh, talking about uh, the, the Bombardier acquisition one year on. I mean, clearly, you know, everyone's lives have really changed over the last uh, two years. We started with the initial lockdown. And uh, during the lockdown periods, we, we actually acquired uh, uh, Bombardier. So that was in December of uh, 2020. Uh, and then since then, uh, it's been quite a, uh, um, uh, a full on time for, for both, both sides of the, of the new organization in terms of pushing forward with the integration. My role of that was on day one, I was actually asked to, to look after from an Austin perspective uh, the, the review of the XPT projects, so that ranged everything from the, uh, the Crossrail project through to the uh, uh, delivery of trains into West Mids, which we'll talk a little bit about later, 
Uh, so I spent three or four months looking at those projects and how they were integrated into the company. Um, I then disappeared back into the Austin world for about six weeks before I was asked to come look after engineering in, in August last year. So, uh, so my life has, has been very much dominated by the acquisition uh, for, the last, uh, for the last 12, 14 months. Uh, it's, been, it's been a fascinating time. It's been a tough time, uh, but it's been a fascinating time in terms of understanding how the two companies have actually uh, uh, been able to, to, to drive forward using the expertise and resource of both X organisations. Um, just, as a, just as a side issue, I actually do some work with Ashton University as well. Uh, in terms of uh, how we actually take a service concept of doing business and actually apply it to an OEM, uh, new build supplier. Um, so obviously, lots of smaller companies in the Midlands, OEMs, in terms of uh, uh, little opportunity or little uh, activity within the service environment. And my role with Aston is to think about well, how do we actually take those companies and actually give them some longer term look ahead in terms of service. So I've done that work with, with Aston for the last year. Uh, the last three or four years. Okay, so enough about me for the time being. A little bit more about Sir George. Uh, Sir George Ramshaw Curry. Um, I mean, it's great privilege to be able to actually be here today and, and actually give this lecture, give my reflections of the last year. Um, done a little bit of research on George, and uh, um, basically, is a an influential player in terms of the development of the supply chains and the promotion of the supply chains in the UK. Uh, if, we, if we look back at the actual history and the uh, and the creation of RIA, then George was one of the founding uh, players of the of what we love today is the Rail Industry Association and the supply chain that supports. Uh, George actually was instrumental in promoting the rail industry. Uh, not just in the UK, but also to overseas territories, and uh, very much recognise that the rail industry is is very much uh, dependent on the capabilities across the full supply chain uh, out, out with the uh, with the operators. So, to me, uh, George, visionary, thinking about the value that the supply chain creates, but also looking at about the technology that comes within the supply chain in the industry, and, and recognising it's about the people rather than just the technology. And it is, it's people that actually innovate that creates the technology in its own way. So George had a very much a focus on supply chain and people, innovation, and obviously he, he also uh, uh, bequeathed the anarchy that comes to make uh, this, this lecture on an annual basis. So what I want to do today is actually cover three uh, key topics. Uh, one is the significance of combining two key players in the industry. We'll talk that through. Talk through about the integration lessons that we, we have learned and our learning, uh, and also the future, and thinking particularly on technology about how we actually uh, uh, rise to meet the challenge of uh, the zero uh, emissions over the coming years. I'm sure there's a number of you in the room that can actually tell this story far better than me. Uh, I've, I've been around some of it, uh, certainly the last 21 years. And obviously, being an ex-press tonight and an ex-person from Lancaster, uh, I, I am aware of the Dick uh, English Electric Heritage that obviously evolved into, into GEC, which then evolved into a company called Jack Alston, uh, GEC Alston, and also ultimately in Alston itself. Um, obviously, on the other side of the organisation, uh, we, we, we go through the uh, Church Lane, uh, operated by the Midland Railway, uh, right the way through the... Um, uh, the, the creation of Adtrans right the way through to Bombardier and then the acquisition itself. So there's a there's a, a long, thick, plotted history uh, within the UK of the new company. And it'll come through in the other slides. I think it does really show that the uh, um, sort of the entire tradition of rail in the UK is actually now within the new company Alstom. Certainly when we look at manufacturing. You know, if you think about the, the various the various locomotive and carriage works, then what exists today is is very much within our hands. So it's it's a responsibility, and it's responsibility that we need to actually develop and grow and flourish as we uh, as we as we go forward uh, over the coming years. Go through to integration challenges. Um, the first point is about cultures. Um, 
I have to say, having worked in the two organisations or the two parts of the organisation now, I have to say the cultures between uh, Alstom and BT to, to, to the core are very, very similar. Uh, I think the, the way that the two companies have actually worked together over the last, uh, last 12 to 14 months, leverage capability, leverage uh, the, the transfer of personnel between the two organisations. And I have to say, in terms of working organisations today, I, I very rarely see the XBT or the ex Alston uh, branded position actually being played out. Uh, so I think that's a, a true, a true, a true um, uh, positive for the uh, uh, for all individuals involved in the new company in the UK. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the challenges we have is actually bringing together two systems, uh, which is far, you know, far greater. You think about the actual manufacturing systems and ERPs. That's a far longer term activity that we need to actually focus on. And um, that, but by actually combining those systems and integrating systems, that's the way we really will be able to actually get some leverage, particularly in terms of the, uh, the actual manufacturing uh, efficiency and base. Um, securing synergies is, is, is obviously going to be a key, key focal point. Uh, but I think in terms of the UK market, in reality, the, the, the two X organisations are very complementary. Uh, rather than a huge degree of overlap. And I'll cover that point off a little bit more in the, in, in the presentation itself. Um, clearly, uh, with XBT uh, projects, the new build projects out of Derby, then clearly there has been many, many challenges. And again, I'll refer, refer to these as we actually go through the presentation. Uh, but that has consumed a huge amount of time uh, from, from the broader organisation to actually focus on these eventual projects. And, you know, we talk about projects of 2,660 cars across six major customer base. And if you think about Washington Heath from uh, to 2000 or 2004, Washington Heath and the Juniper Carradies were talking 444 cars and uh, 477 cars for Pendolino. So you think about it, there's less than a thousand cars that exercise a lot of mines in Washington Heath at the back end of the 90s, early 2000s. And yet we're talking 2,660 cars with uh, with the portfolio out of Derby today. So that just shows the the, the, the scale of the of the challenge, but also the scale of the actual prize uh, when we actually complete the adventure program. Um, and of course, in all those challenges, we we we, we have to meet uh, while still delivering the, the service business in the UK. And again, I'll talk through the 3,000 staff we have in the service operation in the 30 plus sites. And there, there on the screen, we actually have a little bit of the uh, the, 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 the past and current through the Pendolino, uh, which is remarking before, it's, uh, it's 20 years in service this year, uh, 20 years since the Commonwealth Games in Manchester in 2002. Uh, and then on the left-hand side is the, is the first of the, uh, the West Midlands three-car units, which are there to actually replace the 323s. And they're just going through the, the first sale process now. So that very much is a picture of the uh, of the, the 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 current and the future uh, within the UK market for Alston. Right. Everyone likes a bit of clean, clean piece, wood. <laughs> the good, the bad, and the ugly. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the 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 good to start off with, and uh, this is all in the context of the, the integration that is, of course. Um, so. Reflecting before, and we start looking at the, uh, the size and footprint of the new company in the UK, um, when you pull the numbers together, it really does make you feel as though it is a huge organisation. You know, so we start thinking about 33 sites in the UK, uh, we think about 6,000 employees in the UK, and you know, we start looking at the customer base that we actually serve. There are very few, zero rail customers in the UK we don't actually supply rolling stock or services to. And, uh, and these are just three, um, three uh, graphics just to, to illustrate that point. So obviously we have Pendolino, uh, which uh, we've, we've, we've had a, that, 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 that um, uh, involvement with for 25 years. At the top, we've got the Aventra projects, and that's a great angry unit. Um, and then on the right-hand side, which is a lesser known factor, the, uh, is the monorail units that we're actually building for, uh, for Cairo. Uh, we just dispatched the first of the units to, uh, to Cairo in the first of I think it's 40, 40 units. Um, so again, you know, a very diverse uh, 
uh, set of, uh, of uh, products and also uh, a diverse set of significant number of customers. If I then turn that into a footprint, well, we've talked about rolling stock, but we also think about services, and think about signaling businesses in the UK, and we also think about systems and infrastructure. Uh, so again, it's a combination of, of four product lines. And then on the right hand side, it's very, very busy, but it's very, very busy for a reason in terms of the, the number of sites that we do actually have in the UK. And um, I think it's fair to say that we, we probably have four key sites across Crewe and Derby and Ilford and Widnes. Uh, they're probably the, 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 the main sort of industrial sites that we actually have in the UK. And then we, uh, we, we, we have a, uh, some stats in there in terms of the 50% of the UK rail journeys uh, based on Alston, uh, Alston products. Uh, I think 100% of the London Underground and RFL stock is, uh, is XBT or X Alston pedigree. Uh, and in terms of the service contracts we have, a very, very diverse portfolio right the way through from ser full service on Crossrail right the way through load train, right the way through to Pendolino. So it is a, a truly diverse set of maintenance uh, remits and also it's a, it's, a, it's a product line level. It goes across the uh, the four main product lines uh, within, the, within the company. If we look at Derby, um, I mean, Washington Heath was large and then I went to Derby. And uh, <laughs> it's, uh, I mean, it's a huge, huge site. And uh, I mean, at the present time, we've got 2,200 employees. There's 1.4, I said 1.1 million hours manufacturing in uh, in 2020, and that will have ramped last year, and it ramps again this year. Uh, so uh, obviously, major, major employer, and the site itself, um, you know, long sites old, as is uh, as is as is uh, the, the, the Derby works. I mean, it's been modernised over time, uh, so you know there has some. Uh, state-of-the-art facilities on the site, particularly the, uh, the main production lines and also the test phase. Uh, and also we have a test track, 1.4-kilometre uh, test track that's, uh, that's used heavily for, 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 for shape down running. Uh, but effectively, it's, the, it's, it's not just the manufacturing units, it's also the uh, design shops. I think I was George introduced in terms of uh, 400 engineers uh, in, in Derby, which, which is located in an old J shop that's just been renovated into, uh, into a very, very modern design environment, which will house probably 252 and 60 engineers. Uh, but basically, the Derby site is the only site in the UK that's got that full end to end capability. And the Derby engineering teams, yes, they'll have to take from uh, aluminium extrusions, design a car body shell, uh, design bogies. Uh, and also, uh, obviously, for the full interiors. So it's again, it's, it's the only facility in the UK that has that full end-to-end -end capability. And uh, as we as we look at engineering in Derby over the next uh, year, eighteen months, yes, we see a little bit of a tail off in completing a venture. Uh, but um, from a global Austin point of view, there's a lot of focus on in terms of Derby supporting the global organisation. So I'm currently looking at. Uh, Know how we actually support the likes of uh, projects in Vienna uh, and also in uh, Barcelona uh, and, and, and other locations across the Austin globe. Uh, so Derby Engineering is seen as a jewel in the crown of the company. The company wants to use that capability while there is a, a downturn in engineering workload off the back end of the venture. So big, big facility. If we look at the actual service footprint, uh, again, this is where we've uh, this is where we've uh, combined two large service companies. Um, think about the X Alston, which is predominantly northwest uh, focused. So this is Witness uh, and also like a long site. Uh, but then if you look at the actual uh, the, the XBT footprint, heavily based London, and here we've got pictures in Kitilford. There's, there's an X Alston unit there in terms of Golders as well. But 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 Bombardier, very very active in London on the back very much of the Electrostar contracts and also in terms of inventories. Basically we have we have 28 sites and 3,000 people in our services business. Um, and we're still on the good before we get to the bad. 
We have quite a few slides on those, but anyway, in terms of the good, and this is again the the, the, the border points, which uh, I suspect Jody's probably closer to than the most. But this is this is associated with the, the infrastructure work that we conduct in the UK. Um, so uh, we effectively have got a, a, an infrastructure business. They've actually fitted out uh, the, the, the tunnels for Crossrail in terms of the track and the catenary. Uh, clearly, we have a major major signalling business and one of the largest network rail uh, contractor for signalling in CP6. Um, and, and obviously, we're very uh, very much focused in terms of um, uh, digital in cab signalling through ETCS. So, recognise that this is very complementary to the uh, uh, to, to the rolling stock and services by actually having knowledge at the system level. And I think when I start looking at one of our key focal points at the moment, and that's like Crossrail and the opening of Crossrail. Crossrail is a fantastic example of a railway that is a true system. Think about the number of interfaces between the Crossrail trains and the infrastructure. Whether it's going from driver only technology and CCTV, you know, whether it be the uh, uh, electrification, whether it be the in cab signalling uh, through ETCS or CBTC, whether it be the platform screen doors, you now I can go on. And, uh, you know, it truly is a, a true rail system as opposed to rolling stock running on a bit of train track and pulling a little bit of uh, juice off the catenary. So, uh, so I think having this broader systems capability actually adds something to that understanding of the, of the true system. Well, this is a last good slide now. And this is, uh, this is, this is, this is a venture, uh, which um, again, in the, in the ex Alston world, uh, we didn't have a product for the UK market. Uh, the products we were bidding at the time were very much uh, adaptations of the uh, of fleets across Europe. And of course, that's difficult to, to bid into the UK market. So really, having lost uh, the Juniper platform uh, for the UK, then that put us in quite a difficult position about actually supplying rolling stock here. And I think that that, that, that was proven by how successful we weren't over the uh, over the 15 years after uh, Washington Heath. Uh, so, so the acquisition uh, actually gave fantastic products for all the Aventra. And uh, obviously, the Aventra was developed from Electristar, which again was a fantastic platform that sold thousands of units into the UK. And uh, Aventra was a train that was designed with a passenger in mind, but also to be competitive in the franchising process. So when we think about franchising, it wasn't just, it's not just about capital cost, it's not just about service cost, it's also about track access and energy. So if we take that mix of four uh, financial strains, and Aventra was, was born from the optimised uh, whole life cost perspective. And these just show uh, for, for the, the, the great contracts we have at the present time. We have Anglia, we have Southwest, uh, we have West Mid, and we have um, um, C2C, isn't it? Our dotation of Anglia. Um, I think Aventura is being considered as a platform. It's not really. It's, it's six separate projects. And if we look at the, the diversity, from in cab signalling through to conventional signalling. We we'll look at 25 kV to 750 volt for DC. Uh, we we'll look at three car, we we'll look at five car, we we'll look at 10 car, uh, we we'll look at some ETCS. Uh, it, it just goes on in terms of the, 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 the flexibility of the platform, but it's not a platform because each project is different and each, and each, and each project's got a different customer. So in reality, these are six separate projects built up off a, uh, off a, um, off a, uh, a set of building blocks. Uh, but again, it, it's, it's great to have that platform to be able to actually develop the UK market in a way that before the acquisition, Alston didn't. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it sets up the UK for the, for the, for the future. And as I said on there, it's 2,660 cars, which uh, I think put into context, I think the UK rail market today is 14,000 cars. Uh, thereabouts. So it's, uh, you know, we are injecting sort of 15, 16, 17 percent of the, the UK uh, rolling stock into the market over the next two years. Right, that's good. Bad. So I think it's well documented some of the cash challenges of the, uh, of the XBT world off the back of the regional jets 
uh, business. And uh, I think from the stem, yes, a fantastic design in terms of inventory, but how it was then deployed was left some, uh, left some challenges. And some of the actual supply chain challenges that came out of cash situation uh, really caused issues in terms of uh, the, the confidence and supply base and also the levels of inventory that starts to build. And this, this was a little video which uh, we can't show on PDF, but it's a little flyby on the site and the amount of inventory that is actually amassed in, in Derby Works uh, on, at the point of the acquisition. Yes, we've had COVID and COVID had been challenging and that had put another dynamic onto the site itself. But the, the, the actual challenge in actually planning the supply chain, supporting the supply chain, actually cash challenge in the supply chain really, really caused issues uh, with the venture. So one of the, uh, one, of the, one of the real challenges for Austin in terms of uh, the, the first few, few weeks of the acquisition was to re-inject uh, finances into the actual supply chain itself to, uh, to try and uh, stabilise. Um, I think, you know, if we looked at the, the, the cash position of inventory on the Watchers, on the, sorry, on the Lichurch Lane site, it was, uh, it was eye-watering in terms of the, the challenges. So, bad very much about inventory and stock control uh, and what impact that had in terms of the delivery of the inventory fleets. Um, if we take that, not just at inventory level, if we take it at uh, the train level, this is a shot. Shot. I think it's having needles. It's uh, it works well. Uh, and you can see these are all new adventures. So, uh, you know, when when you ask, when when you start looking at just in time, it's uh, we should be looking at uh, uh, building units to actually sell, not to actually put into storage. And uh, you can see uh, the number of cars there. They're all cars, part complete. Off the Lipchase Lane site, and uh, this this is basically where we uh, we we were 12 months ago. Um, I think in total, uh, five, six, seven hundred cars uh, that were part complete, and uh, of course trying to actually manage the configuration, and then the refurbishment and supply of those units, uh, big big challenge. Um, so that's a, that is basically a mast on the. Uh, uh, out of the XBT organisation, and that that was the the big financial headache uh, that we actually had to manage. And of course, if we start looking at uh, if we start looking at the uh, the delay on a number of the the actual projects, these these are all the headlines that uh, were, were, have been in the last sort of uh, what two two years, and uh, yeah, it's. Uh, not a particularly comfortable position on day one of acquisition. And uh, you know, so these are some of the challenges. Yes, we're known about by the broader company, but uh, some of the detail and nuances, they, these were only sort of identified in the, in the early weeks after the acquisition itself. So quite some challenges. And uh, to, 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 to be fair, some of the headlines are probably quite similar to what you could have written about Washer Day 15 to 20 years prior to that, uh, prior to that uh, time. So in terms of improvement that it was actually needed, I think if you look at us, that's a, that's a classic manufacturing process for rail. So we have the uh, launch. So what, what do you need to be in place to actually launch a build? Uh, the, the first point is having a complete design. And um, if we look at uh, quite a few good programs on discovery about manufacturing. And if you look at one of the key rules of manufacturing, is don't put change into manufacturing production process. If you do, you won't, you'll, you'll fail. And uh, there's, there's lots and lots of examples. And one I like to use is the, uh, uh, the Second World War Liberator bombers. Uh, Americans couldn't even produce those using Ford manufacturing techniques. And the reason why was the amount of change it was still actually being fed into the production line in the, in the early days of Liberator build. So the decision to freeze the design and within, within a few number of months, uh, the actual production facility was actually at record levels of output. And I think if we look at the, the level of change it was flowing through a venture uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the early days, it was significant. And that's one of the reasons why I'm going to struggle to build. And certainly the level of change to an incomplete config and design obviously led to a lot of the actual work in progress. 
So this this is the this is the classic process. It would actually go from a, a, a patch control launch through a sub assembly launch uh, through hitting the materials through to car assembly. Uh, from car assembly, it would actually go through tests, uh, from tests into what we'd call PC11, which is uh, uh, acceptance for dispatch off the, off the Derby site. Uh, then go through various shakedown and fault free running. Uh, and then OTD is on time delivery because that's effectively selling the, the units as, as, as provisional acceptance to the uh, to the customer. And uh, I haven't got the precise figures, but that, that sort of uh, attack time should be counted in weeks, not months or years. And if you count it in many months for a few years, that's the reason why we end up with lots and lots of working capital. Um, so what we've basically done is actually firstly put a lot of liquidity into the supply chain uh, to, 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 to kickstart the supply chain. Um, we've actually put strong uh, controls in place in terms of configuration management and design control. Uh, and also we've actually put a turn of experience loops back in from uh, in service and fault free running back into the manufacturing process and back into the, uh, the test process. So those have been the main sort of lessons that we really applied. But the key is actually putting rigor in terms of the, the required config. So when you start building uh, a unit on the line, you've actually got an agreement that the output uh, will be purchased by the customer. Uh, if you start building when there is not config, it's actually uh, uh, agreed, then clearly it's going to start building with working capital. And then that's, that's effectively where we we were in terms of uh, um, Derby from, from 18 months ago. So I think it's fair to say now on the, on the site, there, there are signs of improvement. Uh, that's from Roger Ford uh, from, uh, from a couple of months back. Um, we've got far more rigor in terms of the configuration management on the site. Um, I think it's fair to say in Anglia, we're up to uh, about 60 units sold now. Obviously, Crossrail's been fully delivered. Uh, low train is approaching full delivery, and uh, we are seeing uh, good signs of improvements in terms of reliability, which is uh, is partly driven by the uh, uh, software of the, the trains actually maturing, uh, but also driven by improved quality through the uh, manufacturing facility as well. So yeah, I think we're on an upward path. There's still a lot of work to do, uh, but uh, we're in a far better position now compared to 12 months ago. And uh, I can see it's actually to, to really start getting good quality units from, uh, from Derby and shortening that full manufacturing time. Then just go a little bit on the people. Um, as I said at the start of the lecture, uh, in a high technology industry, it's all about the people. Uh, and, and it truly is. And uh, this is a very, very busy chart. But one thing I have been impressed with with, uh, with our colleagues is the, uh, is, is the energy, enthusiasm, competency of the engineering staff that I inherited at the Church Lane. Uh, very professional. If I look at the demographics, very encouraging as well. And I think it's fair to say with the venture and all the actual investment in government, it enabled uh, XBT to invest heavily in graduates and apprentices. So if we actually look at the, uh, at the actual middle uh, um, uh, KPI, it actually shows demographics. So I was quite surprised. So the largest population of engineers in, in, in Derby and in the XBT world are actually the age, age range of 25 to 40. Now I come from a, an organisation where that demographic would be uh, inverted, i.e. my age group would be the... Uh, would be the biggest uh, population, but it's not. And I think that's most encouraging in terms of uh, in Derby. We have got a far younger engineering team, um, probably not young by industry comparisons, but certainly for rail, it is a, it's a young team in Derby. And I think so the reason why that is because of the success of the graduate schemes on the back of the adventure uh, design contracts. Um, and the other, the other noticeable point is, and it doesn't stand out so much on this slide, but it's the actual gender diversity as well. So yes, 17% females, but a lot of the actual females that were actually recruited have gone more into customer-facing roles. 
in terms of project engineer managers and also uh, uh, chief engineers. And the, the, the caliber and standard of the young females in Derby is as good as I've seen it anywhere else in the industry, uh, top notch, and it gives a far greater impression of the, of, of the uh, quantity of females within the engineering discipline itself. On top of that, we've got a very diverse uh, population from the nationality point of view. So you can see on the right hand side that 25% uh, of our, our team in Derby are, are, are not rich by native background. And uh, yeah, we've, got, we've got a big collection of, um, of, of, of uh, uh, cultures and nationalities, which of course reflects British life today, which again is one of our uh, one of our aspirations to make sure our workforce does actually reflect the travelling public as opposed to being very uh, white, middle class, uh, male, middle aged, etc. So I think in terms of the demographics for Derby, they're very encouraging. Uh, and that's 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 a factor that I'm quite keen to uh, to drive and promote. And also, I think it, it actually gives future contracts a lot of a uh, lot of diversity, a lot of experience. Uh, and uh, it's, it's it's a real jewel in the crown of British engineering. Just got a little bit on technology. Um, I think decarbonisation is 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 the key thing. Of our, uh, of our uh, era. Um, within the old Alston, we actually focus very much about, uh, about hydrogen technologies for traction, but moreover, electrification with actually having our system of business. So, our, our main push was electrification coupled with, um, uh, coupled with hydrogen. But with the acquisition, uh, we've actually secured battery technology as well. Um, battery technology had been developed by uh, uh, by Bombardier. Uh, I, I can reflect back on some of the RSSB funded topics in terms of battery driven electric stars. Uh, so that battery technology plus hydrogen plus electrification actually gives a, uh, a good set of tools in the toolbox to actually fight the, uh, the climate uh, challenges that we're faced today. And it's fair to say electrification is still the most efficient uh, and, it, and it has to be. Um, but once the actual wires are up, the, the products are the lightest, the most track friendly, uh, the quickest, uh, and also can actually operate in, um, in, 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 in high density, in high power situations. But however, uh, putting wires up is, is not always easy, and always, certainly from a business case perspective, it is difficult to justify in terms of uh, lower density, lower power traffic. So I think it's uh, it is very much a policy uh, and, and recommendation that uh, we, we do need multiple tools in, in the toolbox to tackle uh, decarbonising the rail industry. And that's very much reflected through uh, lots of really nice speed recommendations. So from, from the Austin point of view, I think we've got, we've got a nice mix of, of technologies now within the new organisation. These are these are just some of the uh, the, the the actual um, pros and cons of the various tools in that toolbox. Um, I've always alluded to in electrification, up to 360 kph and probably more. Uh, when the big you know, big point there is about high frequency, high power usage, uh, and clearly it's 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 it's, it's cleaner, it's simpler, and it's lower cost in terms of rolling stock. Uh, hydrogen. Uh, very much a competitor or replacement for, for DMUs, uh, up to a thousand kilometres autonomy or range, uh, up to 100 miles an hour. Um, and, and, and clearly, the big challenge for us is, is lack of the existing infrastructure for refueling. That's, that's one of the challenges with hydrogen. And then finally, batteries uh, up to around about 60 miles or 100 kilometre range. Uh, is cheaper, uh, similar sort of uh, speed as the as hydrogen, uh, but clearly it's got a lower range, and uh, it does have the ability to be able to uh, um, provide for gaps in electrification. So I think it's fair to say all those technologies are, are complementary. It depends on the duty cycle and it depends on the, the the capital cost of electrification in terms of where these technologies actually play out. 
In terms of Karate eyelids, this is our this is our hydrogen uh, train. It's uh, it's being sold across Europe. Um, I think that this is a uh, is almost a semi electric car. It's hybrid technology. Uh, we've actually got electrical supply through the hydrogen and fuel cells, uh, supplying onto a DC link that then is either feeds a battery or it feeds an inverter onto uh, onto traction motors. Um, that's been developed and uh, we actually supplied, I think it's 40, 41 trains uh, in Germany and is under contract in, in a number of other European countries at the present time. Uh, so that's the very simple top level layout of the Karadi Islands. And today in service, it's been successful and it still you know, continues to receive a lot of interest from the, uh, from the operators. Uh, yeah, talked talk a little bit about the capabilities. But I think I, I just I just refer to it as almost a diesel, a, a zero emission a diesel unit. It's effective replacement for a diesel train uh, with an autonomy up to a thousand kilometres. And then we we'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, batteries. Um, we, we we have batteries now being tested in Germany. Uh, on XPT rolling stock, and also we actually have an order in Ireland uh, where the, the Dart has actually got a new contract for, uh, um, for several hundred EMUs, and there are variants of that EMU with battery capability, and that's part of the core scope of the uh, first branch of supply into Ireland, which uh, is currently being designed at the moment. And then we, we have actually got an agreement, a memorandum of understanding with Eversholt uh, to develop a hydrogen unit for the UK. Um, I think the challenge with hydrogen is quantity. So if we're actually looking at uh, developing and designing a new train and we, we look at volume, it's difficult to generate business cases. So I think the manufacturers have got the responsibility of, of being able to actually develop modular hydrogen so that we can take a base platform and be able to uh, modulize the hydrogen uh, elements of that design so that we're not looking at all the full fixed costs to actually go onto a hydrogen contract. Uh, let's face it, probably unlikely we're going to see three or 400 hydrogen cars being procured. It's more likely to see it in smaller batches. So I think from a manufacturer's point of view, we've got to think about the integration and how that integration can be made cost effective. Uh, and I suspect from a uh, 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 an owning perspective, uh, the owners need to think about well, what what is the what is the effective uh, economic batch sizes uh, to supply hydrogen. So yes, the technology is there, but it's how do we actually get a commercial proposition that works? Um, and, that, and that's probably been the challenge of the last two or three years, and I think it'll continue to be so of the uh, near future. And then we then move on to HS two. Uh, so uh, we, we secured, along with Hitachi, a uh, contract to supply HS2 to Ron Stock. Um, that JV uh, was set up in December last year, or set up, it was awarded the contract in December last year. And uh, we, we worked to, uh, to, to, to work through with HS2 in the concept design phase at the present time. Very exciting, it's a long term project. Um, and deliver those units won't be till the back end of this uh, this decade, uh, with three series to be delivered. Um, we're obviously working well with Hitachi in terms of Hitachi scope is the uh, is the car body shells, uh, electrical traction and TCMS. The Austin scope is the uh, bogey design and delivery. Interestingly enough, the bogies will actually be designed in crew. Not crew. They'll be designed in Derby and built in crew. Uh, so, you know, true British affair to actually uh, design and deliver the bogies. Uh, and then, in terms of the Alston scope, it'll be interior design and supply. And then the, the cars will actually be supplied from Newton Aycliffe in terms of the car body shells and they'll be fitted out in, in, in Derby. So, it's, you know, it's a true collaborative relationship with Hitachi. Uh, uh, going well. Uh, and obviously, being a Northwesternite and now living in the Midlands, I look forward to seeing these in service for my retirement. Uh, 
I am quite old. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, I think that's that's probably the, the, the you know the, the flagship project to to actually celebrate the uh, the new company. So I had threatened to go on for an hour and twenty, but I haven't. Uh, and I'm just going to, to to draw some conclusions. So I think in terms of George, talked about George at the uh, at the start of the lecture. Uh, reflecting on his, his, his importance of the, of the supply chain to support the industry and also reflecting in terms of the, the importance of a you know, technology based industry. Uh, it's about the people that make things happen. Um, I think you know, going, going through the actual, uh, uh, the, my thoughts for the last 12 months, absolutely right. It is about the supply chain and it is about the people that actually drive innovation and drives the technology. And uh, I think in terms of the new company, uh, we've got a huge responsibility to safeguard the supply chain in the UK, and in fact, grow the supply chain in the UK. And I think in terms of people, uh, we've, we've got similar responsibilities. Uh, clearly, we've got a, a long-term look ahead with the likes of the you know, closing down the adventure pro projects and looking at HS2, but also in terms of some of the skills we have in the UK. How do we actually secure those for the longer term? Um, you know, the UK market is always going to be a little bit cyclic, and uh, yes, when with COVID and the uh, demise of franchising, there is a lull in rolling stock procurement at the present time. So, so how do we safeguard that talent? And uh, you know, what, what, one of my key aims is to be able to secure overseas work for engineers, uh, not just to secure the work, but also to grow talent as well and, and get, get diverse experience across, uh, across a far broader organisation and company. So, yeah, Austin has that responsibility in terms of uh, preserving and, and, and optimising and growing the supply base. Yes, we have the, the responsibility to actually learn from integration and develop a, a broader and better uh, and more efficient company. Uh, and with that, obviously, secures jobs and, uh, and, and capability in the UK for the longer term. And I think we also have the responsibility to look ahead, particularly in terms of the climate challenge as well. And uh, I've alluded to a number of technologies there, uh, but that's, it, it's a journey and, and, and there's more to come on that front for sure. So, yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity today, George. Um, I think it's, uh, it's, it's been a, a useful exercise for myself to reflect on the learning lessons from the last 12 months. And uh, I look forward to the hard work working within the supply chain and within the company to deliver an exciting future for the, uh, for the company. Thank you. Great, thank you. And, and Mike is agreed to take some questions as well. So, um, in order to make the best use of, of both environments and make sure everybody gets uh, the same kind of experience, we've got two mechanisms by which people can ask questions. So, for the people in the room, uh, which is where I'll start, um, we've got a, a roaming mic. So, yes, there's a microphone. So, the purpose of using the microphone is that when you're talking, the people who are online can hear what you're saying. Um, so I recognize everybody in the room will be able to hear what you're saying, but it's about uh, the people who are online. Um, for those of you who are online, and we've got over 70 people on the calls, so, uh, so you know, almost 100 uh, between the two, um, you will realize that you can't turn on your microphones and you can't turn on your cameras. Um, so we're using the chat. Um, I think you can wave and you can certainly applause um, and use those other features of Teams, um, but please do uh, post your questions in the chat. Um, and also, if you do find, in order to help me, if there's a, a large number of, of, of questions, um, if there are some particular questions there that you like, um, then please do like those um, in the usual, uh, using the usual Teams te technology to be able to do that. And then that'll help me to understand what some of the popular, popular questions are and be able to use um, the time to best advantage. So, having explained the rules of engagement, um, people in the room, uh, I'll come to you first. Um, so, uh, any questions from from people in the room? Peter, Peter, oh, microphone there. So, when people are um, talk, or certainly people in the room, if you could just um, name and affiliation would be helpful as well. Uh, Peter Gracie, uh, Mike, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation on how buying a team. Um, thinking about the combining two organisations together, obviously there was competition prior to what would be the bits that you don't need? Good question. 
Uh, thank you. If, if we look at the actual organisation's capabilities in the UK, uh, and I look at the, the ex Holston, it's very much services and it is very much uh, signalling. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't supplied rolling stock in the UK for, for since, since Pendolino uh, back in 2002. Uh, if I look at BT, the ex BT world, uh, very much about rolling stock supply from the church lane. Uh, so that was entirely complementary. And also it was about uh, services. And, and, and services are almost tied to the product, uh, i.e. The, the product that's manufactured by the OEM. So in reality, there hasn't been in the UK a huge number of decisions to take in terms of uh, is it product A, is it product B, is it, is it, is it depot X, is it? So, so, so I think we, we've, we've been pretty complementary. I think the, 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 um, the areas that but we still need to be explored further. Are going to be those areas that are driven through the, the, the various ERP and systems that we actually have. Because uh, I think at the, at the present time, we've actually still uh, got our own ERPs still very much in place. And therefore, it's, it's a manufacturing system, procurement systems, finance systems. Those are the areas that, that offer uh, better efficiencies so we can actually go and do things quicker, faster, sooner, uh, and also be able to use redeployed resources for that effect. So I think that's about to come over this next year, 18 months. But it, it's a slow journey because it, you know there is risk to projects by starting to transfer uh, project X into, into the manufacturing system. So I have to say I haven't we haven't had to take crucial decisions to date in terms of choices of product area product. Uh, but for the areas that probably will start will be things like uh, in cap signaling. And that's a classic example in terms of heavy cap versus Atlas. Uh, so that, I guess, in terms of uh, the projects that uh, have been have been secured and been delivered, then that technology remains. Uh, but there will be choices, obviously, that need to be made in, in the longer term. So I suspect that choice will be driven through the tendering process rather than by uh, taking decisions on the project. So I hope that answers your question. Okay. And um, we did have a comment on the floor. So, so just a moment, I would say somebody from the chat said that the microphone wasn't picking up. Uh, did, uh, did we got that sort of excellent? Right, very good. Okay, so apologies for that. So I'll take one more question from the room, and I see there's a number of questions in the chat, so I will come to them next. So, uh, Robin, yes. Uh, Robin Grote. Ooh, yes, definitely that working. That works. <laughs> Robin Grote from the Department of Transport. Uh, um, I suppose we should declare an interest. So I did my training in the Church Lane a few years ago, <laughs> a few, quite a few years ago. Um, so, um, one of the interesting things that was developed in Lit Church Lane was the construction of vehicles by bolting them together. It was very unusual, and, and all the places I've been, I've not seen anything quite like it. When you came in as a, an outsider, what was your view on that as a manufacturing technique? Again, a good question. I think, I think if you look at the actual design for the design for manufacturing process, this 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 concept of uh, uh, complete knockdown uh, in terms of effective flat back assembly, um, quite novel. Uh, lots of ergonomic advantages. Uh, lots of hours to actually be taken out of the assembly should actually build in quality. Uh, and, uh, you know, start thinking about the, you know, the process for looming. You know, so you think about a car body shell, traditional car body shell, and trying to loom it electrically. And then you compare that to a, a flat back assembly whereby the looming is actually brought in complete and installed on the underframe or in the roof sections. Then, then clearly there's multiple, multiple advantages. Uh, I think in general, there's a slight weight penalty, but, but really what you should see in terms of uh, quality should should, act, should actually outweigh uh, the, uh, uh, and any hours reduction should actually outweigh that, uh, uh, that deficit. Um, so I think everything in its favour. I think the one challenge we've had is when you then start looking towards modifying, maybe not quite as easy. Um, because by definition, you're actually looming and piping in sub-assemblies and then you bolt them and sub-assemblies together. So maybe not quite as accessible. Uh, but in terms of the, the base principles, I think fantastic. And uh, as you say, it's dominated Derby literature lane, hasn't it, for 
20, 25 years, you know, whether it be on electric styles or whether it be on the subsurface stock or whether it be on a venture. So it's, uh, uh, I've been very impressed. And I think it's, uh, if you look at on the globe, on the global Alston, some of the metro designs have got a smart metropolis design feature, and that, that does accommodate some of the actual uh, flat pack assemblies. You know, that site in Katowice in Poland uses that technology. But in essence, from an engineering point of view, I'd probably say that the Derby engineers are probably the most experienced in, in this production method uh, from a global perspective. And that's something that is, is being leaders at the present time. Okay, good. I'm now going to go to, to the chat for the next question. So I'll read it out. Um, and and so, so there's a number of questions come through which are a bit specific about the fleet. So I, I will come to those, uh, but honest, um, those people on the on the call. But while we were also talking about um, the, the company and the merger, I'll put a couple of those questions first, if, if I may. Um, so the first one uh, from a from a from Peter V is the uh, the person who's posted it. Um, to what extent is the merger being carried out on a national basis, and to what extent is it a company wide basis? So, um, question a bit about the scale of it as a merger. Um, I mean, clear, clearly, it's a, it, it's it's a global consideration. Um, I think what I'd say about the UK elements, it's it's complex from the UK perspective. Just in purely in terms of the actual volume of business, volume of sites, volume of people. Um, I think from a UK perspective, we've actually enjoyed global support. Uh, so you know the, pro the projects we're delivering at the present time, uh, you know so some do have challenges, and also uh, many of the supply chains, particularly internal supply chains, go global. Uh, so I think the we we, we do. Uh, receive a lot of global support into the UK. Um, so I think in general, the I'd, I'd, I'd probably say that the, the, the integration, from what I've seen, has been very much a UK integration, but recognising that this will be cascaded across multiple countries and recognising that we do have standard product lines at a global level that will impact and influence into each of the, uh, into the countries and sites. OK, thank you. And I'll do one more question from the chat before I come back to the room. Um, so so this next question comes from, uh, it doesn't recognise the name of the person, but I'll, 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 I'll go through it anyway. Um, so it says, thanks, Mike, for an excellent lecture. What is the biggest outstanding challenge to get the eventual product to where you want it to be? So there's a couple of, <laughs> there's a couple of assumptions there. A, there's a challenge, and B, it's your view. <laughs> So I think at the present time, I think we've got a good basis to move forward from in terms of uh, improved quality and also improved reliability in service today. Having said that, we've got, you know, still got some some yards to actually put in. Um, I think in terms of the actual um, the, the the base train from an electromechanical perspective is is sound. Uh, you know, if we look at the actual service performance today across electromechanical systems. Uh, yes, there are some issues there, but nothing you wouldn't expect for a new fleet. And probably nothing I haven't seen from other fleets uh, that have been in service for, for, for many years. I think they, with, 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 with modern trains comes modern systems, comes IP networks and complex software. Uh, so there's a, there's a bit of a hint there. Um, I think the, the complexity of the TCMS on the venture has many, gives many, many advantages, uh, but at the same time, it's, uh, it has its own challenges, and we see this on, on, on many of the new fleets in the UK today. I think of our colleagues in Siemens in the uh, Desiro City, etc. That's that, that, that's that's had similar related issues. Uh, so I think it's the integration of the, of the various software suites to the TCMS, and that's you know let's remember uh, we, you know people can talk about the train control system, but every system on the train today has got complex software. You know, whether, it, whether it be from the in cab signaling system, whether it be from the auxiliaries, whether it be from the H track, whether it be from passenger information system, whether it, it just goes on. So there's there's 25 to 30 systems with software that needs integrating through the TCMS, and that's a challenge. Uh, so, you know, I've gone from looking after engineering on a 1956 nuclear station with zero software to going to the most advanced uh, trains in the world. With huge amounts of software, very little, very little hardwiring, everything controlled through an IP network. 
and uh, it takes you into packets and MAC addresses and, uh, and areas and topics that I never thought about in my training. So, so that's that's the challenge. Uh, are we making progress? Yes, we are. And I think it shows through some of the reliability improvements, but uh, that's that's one area. Get that right. Uh, we have a fantastic opportunity to have a properly connected train, proper digital train that we get all the benefits from. Um, and I expect to see that over the uh, over the coming months. Very good. Okay, back to the to the physical room. So there was a hand up there earlier, and it stayed up. So good, excellent. So still a question to be had. Hello, hello, Mike. Uh, Carl Wolf. Um, you mentioned that the uh, interior supply is going to be manufactured in HSC. Is it also going to be designed? In so. The, um, the, 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 the interior of HS2 will be designed uh, from Derby. Uh, we'll actually utilise some of the high speed experience that we've actually uh, uh, seen from our colleagues in Hainesville uh, on, on another very high speed product globally. Uh, but we have, a, uh, we, we have a major team that will actually be in Derby uh, in terms of supporting the, the, the interior's design. Uh, some elements will be designed where there is a benefit from other high speed experience globally out of any stuff, but the, the bulk of the hours for the engineering design will actually be in the, in the UK and Derby. Right. Any other questions from the room? I've got questions in the chat which I'm going to draw on, but I am also going to um, give us another five minutes on the Q&A because Mike has been very gracious this time. Anybody else in the room got any questions? No? OK. Um, so there's a couple of questions in the chat. Um, so, so one followed on from what you were just talking about there in terms of the complexity. So, so the question here is from Danielle. What role do you envisage condition monitoring will have for future service business in the new Alstom organisation? Um, huge. Uh, it, it, simple answer. Uh, I think the, uh, coming back to the point about the actual digital connected train and, and actually having access to 30 to 40 systems on the train through the TCMS through remote comms. Then to me, it's about, well, how do we actually harness that data that's being shipped to show? And uh, you know, it's about actually turning that data into good quality management information. And uh, where we do that is, is, is looking at prognostics. So to say, take, for example, door performance, which on you know, metros are generally right up there in the number one and number two reliability challenge. Then you know, what, what data can we glean on, say, motor currents for each and every door? Now, going back 20 years ago, there's no way you would actually have to get that data. Today you can. And uh, you know, if we've got motor, motor current from doors being shipped to shore, then there's the ability to be able to start looking at you know, motor currents and door, door closing times, which then start alluding to well, when's the optimum time to start overhauling this equipment, uh, or when's the optimum time to carry out corrective maintenance on door 2B on carriage such and such. So I think condition based maintenance. We'll make sure that we maintain at the right time to the right scope, as opposed to looking at an OEM's book that was produced 10 years ago that's, that was probably never right when it was written and certainly won't be right today. So, no, it's, it's, it's absolutely front and centre of our maintenance business. Okay, very good. And I, and I was going to pick on one final question from the chat. Um, so, so, this one is again by Peter V. Uh, it's, uh, it says, You have referred only to passenger stock. Is Alstom in the market to supply freight locos and or rolling stock to the UK market? Uh, and, and the thing I suppose I'd add to that in terms of it reflects on our, our changing marketplace, as opposed to some extent in terms of uh, more people potentially working from home and actually wanting things delivered. So, so the, the dynamic in terms of the passenger versus freight is also changing. So, so that's the question. Are you in that respect? Interesting question. I haven't really thought about freight for the UK market, and I've been much, very much focused on the, the the passenger market. But it's a uh, it's it's a fair common fair challenge. Uh, I think the question for the UK market is one of volume again. Uh, obviously, it's, it's the same discussion as hydrogen in terms of uh, uh, low gauges, etc. And uh, and and what could be packaged for a UK market. So I suspect it depends in terms of volume. Um, for the Muslim freight hasn't necessarily been on my radar of late. Okay, appreciate appreciate your openness. Okay, uh, I'm going to draw us to a close there, Mike. So, so excellent. Thank you very much uh, for giving us some time to take some questions. I am also, however, going to ask Paul to do a vote of thanks. Um, so, would it be best to do the microphone?
What you miss? There you go. Get myself into the view of the camera. Yep. <laughs> so, hi, yeah, I'm Paul Burkett Gray from Transport for London, also the chair of the Railway Division's Events Committee. Um, and I want to say thank you so much, Mike, for speaking this evening. It's been a really fascinating, really insightful. Uh, look at everything that Alstom has done and the huge scale of the challenge uh, of integrating with Bombardier. Um, I think, you know, you've emphasised just how important integration is. Uh, and it was amazing seeing, you know, you mentioned that 50% of UK rail passenger journeys are now on Alstom rolling stock, uh, which really does give that sort of view of just what a huge range of different products and um, sort of scale of the market really is. Um, and I think it was really great that you were quite so sort of open and frank about the challenges that Alstom is now facing and is, it seems, really uh, on the road to dealing with. Um, and I'm very glad to hear that, you know, there's a really strong future for the company and for rail engineering in the UK under Alstom. Um, I was really glad to hear just how much of an emphasis there is on the zero carbon rolling stock, uh, be that battery or hydrogen powered, and just how much investment is going in to realising that, but also it was quite heartening the acknowledgement that actually electrification is such an effective approach um, and the importance of putting up those wires to power the trains and just how useful that is. Uh, it was also really encouraging to see the sort of commitment to the engineering in the UK, be that building uh, the road, the bogies and the interiors for the HS2 new trains, um, but also the fact that both the expertise of the human resources, the engineers themselves, and the manufacturing capacity in the UK might well be deployed on overseas projects and be able to share that knowledge and capacity around the world and already in place with the manufacturer of those monorails for Cairo, which was really quite brilliant to see up there uh, waiting to go. So I just want to say thank you so much for your talk this evening and ask if everybody could join me in thanking Mike in the traditional way. Thank you. Uh, so you get loads of applause from the people in the chat room as well. So excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So it, it does work. Okay. So it'd be remiss of me to let you go while 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 I've still got in the room to make some play, some notices in terms of upcoming events, all of which are available to be booked in the same way you got here today uh, through the Anarchy website. But these are our specific ones that the Railway Division and, and Paul and his team have, have been helping to create for us. So in April um, is the next one. It's the 26th of April. It's um, our wheel set seminar, um, life extension, maintenance, reduction and sustainability, how to get the most from your wheel set. So that's an all day seminar, um, which is, I can say, on the 26th of April. So again, you can register uh, uh, online um, and then attend that event uh, when if you're if you're interested. Um, Following on from that, on the 16th of May, we've got the, the Young Engineers presentation competition, the finals uh, for this year. Uh, so that's on the 16th of May, um, and it's also the Railway Division AGM. Again, you can um, register to, to attend those uh, uh, via the website, um, and, and it'll be good to see you there because I'll be doing the AGM as well. Um, and, and then finally, so I don't want to go too far in the future, on, on the 4th of May, uh, we have uh, another seminar, an all-day seminar, which is batteries included, so quite topical in terms of what we've been talking about today, uh, which looks at the challenges of adopting battery and hybrid technology in the rail industry. Um, so, so that's the 4th of May uh, when we're holding that event. Again, um, thank you very much for, for everybody, both online um, and in the room, for, for joining and taking part today. Um, I'll draw this to a close. Thank you very much. Okay.